Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of Operations Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. Brain Club um, is part of how we at All Brains Belong um, are, are bringing folks together to collectively unlearn and reimagine systems that don't work for so many of us. Um, so this is our educational space to provide education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. And as I said, bring people together based on a shared vision of what's possible to contribute to systems change by shifting norms. Um, by developing shared language and having conversations about um, topics such as um, what we'll be talking about tonight. This is a space where people can collectively learn and unlearn, feel safe, and for many experience something that's different from the outside world um, by promoting new ways of thinking and being. Um, I do want to say this is not for medical or mental health advice. This is not a support group. This is not a place to like um, get into individual specific problems. It's also not a neurodivergent affinity space. We welcome anyone um, who is here to try to learn, to understand um, neurodiversity and understand um, you know, what, what, what it means to be imagining a world where people with all types of brains can get their needs met and thrive. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. You can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. So please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat, you know, whatever, whatever needs doing. And um, you know, you're welcome to where so so I will introduce our speaker shortly. Um, you are welcome to type in the chat box while they are presenting. Uh, there'll be also time for discussion that you can that we can do with mouth words, spoken communication, um, or in the chat. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we it's really important that we create safety by um, asking that you discuss impact of distressing experiences, not events themselves, and that we create space for everyone to process and interact. We do try our best to navigate conflicting access needs. Well, first off, I know to some of you who are new to Brain Club, access needs, what's an access need? We've asked our community um, uh, now for years now talking about how will we know that our community has become more neuroinclusive. And one thing that um, our community advisory board um, ha ha feels strongly about is the idea that educating, normalizing the discussion of access needs is part of neuroinclusive community. Access needs being anything that is required to fully participate in whatever it is that you're doing. Everyone has access needs. It's just that we are more or less um, likely to have our access needs met by the defaults of society, um, depending on our environment. Um, so speaking of access, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And that's my visual support to open the chat. There we go. So speaking of the chat, uh, the last bit of intro that I'll uh, share is that, you know, we, we've we been, um, staff, we've been really thinking about um, the conflicting access needs of using the chat. Um, and the chat, of course, for many is a way of communicating without work mouth words. For many, it's a way of easing working memory, what you have to keep in on the little invisible whiteboard in your brain and remember till there's a time to insert your comment as opposed to just typing the chat when it comes up. It allows for more processing time. More people can share ideas in a short, shorter period of time than would be able to um, without the chat. And of course, less interruption to presenters, and an opportunity to directly engage um, with other community members. Um, you know, many folks, for example, they, 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 they connect about a topic and they make arrangements to, you know, connect offline about the topic, for example. At the same time, the chat for many is visually cluttered. It can be distracting. People can have startle responses when it pops up. And sometimes it moves quickly and can be hard to follow. So it's not that either one is right. 
It's that it, this is an example of conflicting access needs. And part of neuroinclusive community is that we have to figure out a way to negotiate this. So here's what we have to offer you, some ideas. If you are someone who is distracted and distressed by the chat, um, try one of these first, either. After the first time it pops up, try not closing it. Just leave it there because additional messages will replace the old message, but it won't pop up anymore. Um, so if you're on a phone, sometimes that can be easier to ignore, um, but if you're on a computer, it'll still work. You can also disable chat preview. You go to the, you find the, so here's their toolbar at the bottom of Zoom. You look for the chat and this little up carrot. When you click on it, no, go back. All right, it'll it'll show show chat, chat previews, and there's probably a chat a checkbox right there. If you click that and make the checkbox go away, it should stop popping up. Some ideas, um, and when we are using the chat, um, we ask that you type in the main box as opposed to threads, because that can make it hard for some folks to read. Okay, I think I am done with intro. So um, our new topic for the month, connection is the path to health. We know that lacking strong social connection has the equivalent harmful impact on health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And we know that social isolation and loneliness are both rampant um, in the neurodivergent community. And when we think about all the different ways in which people are othered, the, the impact of intersectional marginalization, all of these different um, aspects of identity that are stacked up, the impact of that social isolation um, can be, you know, just exponential. Um, and so um, tonight, I am thrilled to introduce a member of our community. Sarah Knudsen is an ex-lawyer, ex-therapist, survivor activist. Um, they're a blogger for Madden America and the developer of Purely Human, a social justice and power leveling approach to distressing, intense, or extreme experiences. Sarah's work questions mainstream paradigms that separate human experiences into categories of normal and abnormal or sick and well. Sarah, we are so thrilled to have you with us today. And I will stop share and you can reshare whenever you are ready. And I can, so that I know, cause I, I know you switched computers. I can put a spotlight on you so that we can see you. There we go. Did that work? Yes, it did work. All right. Oops. And I'm going to temporarily rename. So now you're on Amy's computer. I'm going to temporarily rename. That looks great, Sarah. Sarah, we can't hear you. You might be muted. Oh, here we go. How about that? There we go. Perfect. That's great. That's, That's wonderful. Again. Start from the top. Social. Welcome to Social Connection as Medicine, the Neurodiversity Edition. Um, so I don't know about you, but I feel like when people talk about social connection, um, I'm in this neurodiversity double bind. People say social connection is great for your health. And I go, I feel awful around people. And they say you should make more friends. And I go like, that's going to happen. Um, and then so and then I started to try to explore like what is going on because I want to care for my health, but actually people scare me. And then I talk to people about it and they go, well, that's stupid. So was so let's see what we if we can make sense of this experience. I don't know if anybody else shares that or not, but um, in any case, uh, since I'm nervous and I do, here we go. Here's the punchline: um, social connections are good for me. They help me survive challenges. They protect me against disease, and there's a ton of research to support this. But only if I feel safer and less stressed. And 
so what does that kind of thing mean for the neurodiversity community? Well, um, in a lot of ways, it means our, it's not our fault. Because if you look at the neurodiversity experience of social connection, there's two things that, are, that, that go against us as far as health. And one is that trying to connect with neurotypical ways of being is pretty stressful. And secondly, trying to um, try being around mainstream attitudes that actively other neurodiverse traits and ways of being is tends to be is, is often quite unsafe. So and both of those things, the lack of the, the increased amount of stress and the lack of safety are barriers to health and they, they create they have actual health impacts. So there's a, there's a wisdom to why a lot of us are socially isolating. It's not just like that we're, we don't we don't get it and everybody else does. There's actual barriers to our participating in social relationships in the same ways that others do. And so the question is, well, why? Why is that happening? Why isn't social connection working for me in the same way that's working for the neurotypical community? And th to answer that question, um, I need to go into a, a few a few statistics and um, and really or, or just sort of the general concept of statistics. There's this concept out there in nature called the normal curve, and what it basically means is that you know you have a lot of a lot of a lot of things in nature are sort of the same, and then you have stuff that and then you get a little bit more variety, and then you get and and that a little bit more variety as you sort of go on out on either side of the curve. And so let's look at what that looks like in human beings. What it looks like in human beings is this: for any given trait that has survival value, what it basically got is a dominant majority of the culture, probably about two thirds. And, and what, what's happening there is that nature is betting heavily on tried and true defaults. Um, so these are things that have worked in the past and are likely to work again in the future. And so this experience of the dominant majority is shared by the majority of the culture. So as a result, a majority of the people in the culture look, feel, act, and view life a lot alike. So they all tend to get each other. And then, and then a little bit further outside of the outside of that curve, um, we have the understandable minority. That's where nature has added in some possibly useful variety, um, a little bit of variation on the tried and true defaults. And the experience differs notably from the majority experience, but it's close enough for the majority to get what's happening with the, my, this understandable minority. And it's close enough for the understandable minority to get what's happening with the majority. So then not so though, with us adducts, because what's happening on, on that side of the spectrum is that um, nature is basically, I'm having trouble actually seeing my slides. So let me see if I can do something about this part of it. There we go. So not so with us adducts, um, because nature is really experimenting in that case and preparing for the rare. And so it doesn't need to do that a lot, but it's, and, and it isn't wise to do that a lot, but it's, it's wise to do that some. Um, and so, but they, as a result, if I'm in that odd uh, duck group, my, my experience is going to radically differ from the majority. And as a result, I'm going to be pretty much baffled and confused by what the majority does. And also the majority is pretty, going to be pretty much baffled by me. What I do is going to appear illogical and extreme and crazy to the majority. Now, that, what, and let's see here if I can, why isn't my, oh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. We got it. Got that. This is social support happening as we speak. I don't know why it's. I think it's that thing right there. Just think we need to stop that. There. I think that's going to work now. Nope. Why is this stopped? Oh, wait, so started up again. Who knew? Okay. Who knew? Um, so here's, a, here's an example of what, what's going on or what might happen. We just went through COVID-19. So in COVID-19, we had this dominant majority, um, and it was, which was your garden variety normal extrovert. They found social isolation really painful. But, you know, I, if I was in that group, I did my part. Um, I was, it was in a lot of pain, but I did my part because that's what we all needed to do. So that was the kind of the normal COVID experience. 
And then there was this understandable minority. So suppose I was a little bit more extroverted than usual. Well, then social isolation took a heavier than usual toll and I needed more help than usual to get through. Maybe I ended up hospitalized. Maybe I had to take a long period off of work or maybe I was more introverted than usual. So in that case, maybe I handled it pretty well, but I missed, uh, maybe, I, maybe I handled it pretty well. I missed people, but you know, I really actually enjoyed the break from social routines. So I, I got through like a lot easier than most, in fact. But then again, not so with Assad Ducks. Suppose here I'm the off the charts extrovert. So now, now my need to interact starts creating risks for others um, or I drive them crazy. Um, I'm maybe breaking into work when I'm non-essential. Um, I'm accosting people on the streets to talk to them, um, that, that kind of thing. And, or else I'm an off the charts introvert where it's like, you guys are way behind the times. I've been, I've been socially isolating. That's not a new thing. Um, I, I, and I probably feel a secret glee that others are off my back and they're finally seeing life from my shoes. Now, under the, under the evolution scene, none of these groups are abnormal. They're all what you would predict from distributing traits across a, across a species in a way that protects the species in a, in a variety of ways. And, and so, and, and, it's, and when you think about it, the people who probably kept the world, would have kept, would keep the world safest in a plague were not extroverts at all. In fact, extroverts, the normal extroverts, they were a risk for us. They were, the, the more extroverted you were, the more likely you were to spread the plague. And the more introverted, the more adaptive for our species was the off the chart, the most adaptive person for our species in a plague is the off the charts introvert. So in that case, evolution was really, that, that rare trait that was in our species was a huge benefit. But that's not how diversity thinks of normal. The nor diversity thinks, hey, we're in the majority, that's good. And you're either too much, if you're, if you're, if you're one side of normal, you're too much. If you're the other side of normal, you're too little. So, and it's not like I'm making that up. There's actually, you know, that the, the basically the, the, the experts on what's normal and not, the American Psychiatric Association actually like says in their manual on what's disordered and what isn't, that if you don't want to end up in a psychiatrist's office or you don't want to get slapped with a psychiatric label, the way you should, the, how you need to act is you need to stay within cultural norms and you need to not exceed the social thresholds of tolerance for specific symptoms or behaviors. So in other words, it's what the society wants to tolerate and what the, what the culture thinks is normal that decides whether you're disordered or not. So that's a very different way of thinking about it than evolution is thinking about it. Basically, it, it, what it's saying is, and what, and what the experts in our culture are giving permission for the majority to think is, normal is what we say it is. Our way is the right way. We get to decide what has value and what doesn't. If it works for us, it gets to stay. If it doesn't work for us, we throw it out. And that sort of creates the must fit in bed. It used to be called the Procrustean bed, but it's 2024. Um, and so what's the must fit in bed? Well, it's about, it's something that majority really creates for, uh, that, that's, that's about what's convenient for majority culture. And, and so, the, and so you fit in if, I mean, the, this, this must fit in bed is really about the, the things that it's, it's about the majority doesn't have to change. It's, a, it's about um, the majority understands majority traits. Um, they operate based on majority traits. The majority doesn't have to adapt or change and the majority feels comfortable and safe. And, it, but again, it's not what's good for our species. It's not like, I mean, we leave a lot behind. Like we've got a little caterpillar saying my legs are too short and we've got a, 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 a beautiful giraffe over here saying my legs are, you know, oh my, I'm too tall. And we've got the must bit fed in bed saying and the only color I like is blue. So it's not about what's good for our species. It's much more like going back to high school and, it, and where, it's, where it's not really science, it's a popularity contest where in the majority we voted and you lose. So then we look at this and we say, well, we'll pick your plan. Do you want the evolution plan or do you want the mainstream culture plan? And under the evolution plan, humanity gets to try, gets lots of tried and true to false. We get some bonus variety. We get new possibilities and protection from the unpredictable. So we, we pretty much cover our bases. 
Under the mainstream culture plan, we get lots of tried and true defaults. And we get maybe some bonus variety, but only if the majority can understand them and everything else gets thrown out. So pick the plan you want to live with. Then And then the other problem is, though, for, for those of us in the neurodiversity community, is it's not just that we're different. There's, there's actually a social disconnection problem that um, that's actively happening as well. And, and this comes from... Um, Robert Sapolsky, um, he studies primates. He's a he's in, uh, professor at Stanford. He's a neurologist and stress researcher. And he says, you know, I've studied a lot of species and sometimes, and, they, and lots of species have, you know, sort of class rankings. And in some species that's better, in some species that's worse. But in humankind, it's not only like that we have class rankings and that makes, that's kind of worse, but actually we're doing something that no other species has done in the history that we're aware of in the history of the universe, which is we as human beings are really getting good at, we are practicing, we are honing the high art and we are developing our skill at making each other feel poor. So take that in for a second, because what does it mean to feel poor? Well, it means I can feel worse than you on almost any, any, in almost any way imaginable as status, opportunities, education, what I know, um, what I have, what I do, um, who, who I am, how I am. It's just this idea of others have it and I don't. And, and so if others have it and I don't, I get to feel bad about myself. And there's and, and also in human in the human species, there's an unprecedented way of, for ways, a number of ways for me to, to know that I that I'm poor, to know that others have it and I don't. I can learn it through pop culture, I can learn it through advertising, I can learn it through social media. I can experience it by being out in the community and I can experience it by interacting with interacting with you. So those are there's a so there's a zillion ways to do that. And it's in and it and in a lot of ways it's bad for health all around. Because what I do is I use the the social power and privilege I have to try to win against you in the game of life. But it's not just a one-way thing. You're also doing the same thing to me. And so I constantly have to be on guard and you constantly have to be on guard. So we're both sort of stressed out. And it, it also incentivizes this kind of social, the social othering, because my status only goes up if I can put you down. And so it incentivizes me to actually look for ways that I have something that you don't so that I can put you down and build myself up. So there's this, and what, what Sapolsky um, observes then, and, and this, what the statistics show is that in, in, a, in these kinds of cultures, which is basically what we're living in right now. It's bad for everybody's health. And there's a reason is it, and what happens is crime goes up. It's, it just makes for a more st stressful place to context to live in. Crime goes up, there's more um, psychiatric and, uh, and addiction problems. There's more school bullying. Um, there's less happiness, less social support and mobility. So it, it's, it's, it's bad all around, but it's, there's a, but there's a, also a differential effect because if I'm an odd duck in that culture um, that, 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 that has a favorite pastime of making low status people feel poor, then I have a disproportionate impact. Safety comes from higher status, neurotypical outranks neurodiverse. So I'm at constant risk of social injury and I'm constantly vulnerable for being, to being poor or to feeling poor. And the result is the result at, makes for stress and unsafety um, often continually, that's really bad for neurodivergent health. And again, not making this stuff up, just you look at the social, the, the research on the social determinants of health. There's a lot of words on that page. I'm not going to read them all, but I am going to summarize them for you. And basically what it says is this, this, you know, this booklet says, Hey, the stuff we need to live and be well is both social and economic. And guess what? A lot of us still can't access that. And the result is breakdown, both physical and mental. And we can predict who this will happen to. And people it happens to are those of us who are low on the social totem pole, which includes neurodivergence. So, so those are the, that's what we're up against. And that's, that, and that's why the fact that we avoid relationships makes a tremendous amount of sense. But supposing we could create relationships that were not so stressful, and that were actually helped us to get rid of stress instead of created stress. And supposing we could create relationships that actually helped us to feel safe instead of threatened, 
what then why would social connection work? What, what would social connection actually do for us that would help us that would that would that would help us to get healthier? And so this is so the key to that is really understanding stress and survival functioning. It's not a direct route. It actually it actually is a, is a route that goes through our bodies. And and the thing that 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 um that's sort of important to get here, and and I and I and it's this is a really good book, the Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Sapolsky, and it it it, it really it goes through and and by the end of it it's like you sort of wiped out across the board. I mean stress just impacts like everything in my body, like whether my glands and hormones and neurotransmitters function, what my heart rate is, what my blood pressure is, what my cholesterol is, how I breathe. You know, how, how well do I, how, what my appetite is, how, how my digestive system works, does my gut hurt, do I metabolize my food, um, do, do I, you know, it affects whether I have the resources to grow and develop, it affects um, uh, what sex, my experience of sexuality, uh, whether I'm able to reproduce, it affects whether my immune system functions effectively and how vulnerable I am to disease, it affects my, my pain tolerance and how much I experience pain. Um, it affects whether I have a memory or not. It affects whether, whether I get a good night's sleep and the quality of that sleep. It affects how quickly I age and how likely I am to die young. Um, it affects um, my mental health, my well-being, things like depression, uh, my motivation, my ability to experience pleasure. It literally changes my personality and my temperament depending on whether I'm stressed or not. And it increases my, it, a hallmark of stress is that it increases my vulnerability to addiction, especially in addictive behaviors that aren't particularly helpful or healthy. So, and then, well, and so but the question is why? I mean, what, what, what about stress that it does that? Why do our bodies respond to stress in that way? And here's just a sort of an illustration to kind of hopefully get across the point a little bit, which is when I feel like enough without having to strain, I get to feel, I, I, then I get to feel relaxed and at ease. But when I feel like I have to be more than I naturally am, then I get, then it's really easy to get, then, then I get, then this, then this stress, this experience of being stressed out comes in. And if it's, it's like Clark Kent, you know, the one side, the, the relaxed person is Clark Kent and the, and the stressed out person is Superman. I mean, it's like the energy that it takes to turn Clark Kent into Superman is phenomenal. And so my body has to somehow transform me from Clark Kent into Superman every time I'm stressed out. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of shuffling around of body resources, which really puts a lot of stress and strain on the body. And so let's just talk about that and, and especially maybe some an illustration so that you can sort of see how this thing works. Because the, like the well-being system, which is kind of life enhancing and life nurturing, um, I call that kind of the ground of being because it's really the stuff that keeps my life going. It's not, it doesn't help me move in the world, but it, it but it's, it's the stuff that allows me to stay in. It, 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 it allows me to actually to live and be alive. And, um, and, and the stuff that happens when I'm in this well-being system and the well, the parts of my, the systems in my body that provide for well-being is I get a good night's sleep. I can digest my food. Um, I can, when, when toxins come in, um, my, uh, I have organs that are specifically designed to, to, to identify them and, and send them back out. Um, my immune system functions well. So, um, I, 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 so I, I, so I have some resistance against diseases. Um, I have enough energy to heal wounds. Um, and I have a, enough energy to grow, uh, and, and, a, and a good quality energy to grow. And which doesn't just affect physical growth, it also affects whether I can learn from experience because learning from experience requires making new neural connections. And if I'm too stressed out, that doesn't happen. So, and then there's also a quality of awareness of, of there's a different way of, of being aware of life where when I'm in my well being system, I'm really able to appreciate the experience of living. When I'm in that survival and life defending system, that's focused on getting rid of a threat, what's happening is I'm not appreciating the experience of living. I'm focused on a, a, a very specific goal. And it's very easy to turn, it's very easy to, to turn you into objects, other people into objects. What I mostly just care about is the end, is this is the end justifying the means. 
can I get out of this situation and who's going to help me to do that and how, and if they can't help me, I don't really care. So then um, we'll, skip, we'll, we'll talk about this, this stress system, which, um, which is basically a rapid response system that amps me up and tries to help me protect, protect my interests um, when the stakes are high, makes me stronger and faster than I'd otherwise be. Um, but this, so, but this activation is at a cost because in order to, in, in, in order for, in order to get that, in order to have that stress activation, um, the, all the energy that I need for stress activation, basically what my stress system does or what that gas pedal system does is pillage the rest of my body for energy. And so for as long as my stress system is actively operating, other tissues and organs are gonna lack the resources they need to function and stay healthy. It's also gonna put a tremendous amount of stress on my heart and lungs and circulatory system. Um, my muscles are gonna stay on, on, my muscles are gonna be on call. So that's gonna put a lot of tension. It's gonna create a lot of tension. It's gonna, they're gonna get tired of being on call. So they're gonna start having fatigue, aching and strain. They might put strain on my bones and joints at the same time. Um, and it's also going to affect, it also affects my coordination. I tend to lose my fine, fine motor coordination and other levels of coordination progressively as, as stress increases. And then it's also going to hose me over for getting a good night's sleep. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to have a, at the very, my, often my sleep, sleep is non-restorative, which results in reduced mental functioning the next day and reduced healing growth and learning because a lot of that happens during sleep. So what's it feel like to be a, ce a cell in my body when I'm stressed? Well, I'm tired, I'm drowning in my own waste. When is somebody gonna pay attention and take care of me? And when you sort of project that across the board that most of the cells in my body are feeling like this under the influence of stress, why my body ends up hating me is I've got you know 37 trillion cells in my body. So I've got an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of unhappiness happening physiologically. Um, when I'm when I'm in stress for long periods of time, um, and then well-being is offline at the same time. So that means that 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 means that my digestion is offline and un, un, and under functioning. So there's no new energy coming in. Um, my I'm having and when, when my digestion shuts down, that means my throat is shutting down, my stomach is shutting down, my gut is cramping, my appetite is going wonky. Usually I lose it, but then it sometimes rebounds. Um, so there's all these swings. Usually what I'm hungry for isn't very healthy because it's about getting energy or comfort, um, which is a very different experience than when I feel safe and safe and comfortable. Um, the same thing with um, toxin elimination, the toxins are being overlooked because those symptoms aren't functioning. My kidneys, livers, and once the stress system turns off, my kidneys, livers, and intestines wake up to like that, to like total, to lots of poisons that they have to deal with. So they're getting a heavier dose. And, and while they're sleeping, cells are being vulnerable to being poisoned. Um, immunity, same, you know, same kind of thing, microbes having free reign. Um, and then repair and then the repair and growth functions offline so wounds aren't healing um and um and vital tissues are wearing out and and then a special thing for a lot of us in this community who have immune issues one of the issues is that repeated activation is going to take my immune system on a uh, on a roller coaster ride and so my immune system is basically going hey yo what's up it's going up and down high low on off and what it's and what it's waking up to is just like a virtual war zone and so it's going to see, it wakes up and it sees distressed and dying cells everywhere. And it's like, well, where did all this come from? And it doesn't, it, and it's, it has to sort out where, what that source is, which just increases the potential for confusion. And then, which would make sense then, I'm just making this up, but it makes sense then that my immune system might get it wrong sometimes and attack me by mistake. So, and even that's not all because the stress system really creates very different ways of thinking and being in the world. Um, and basically the, the long and the short of it is that this, the, that the stress system and the survival system is not very good for long-term decision-making. Yeah, I, I, it's the default is, is, is rapid decisions, rapid choices that are pretty instinctive and pretty impulsive. Um, they're pretty opportunistic and they're pretty much, they're pretty impatient and they, and it tends to worry about consequences later. So that's hard on that, that tends to not be good long-term choices, and it also tends to burn my bridges.
And the reason this is happening is because the high order thinking is going offline. Um, my muscles are hogging up the resources to pump themselves up and my undersupplied brain, the, the part of my brain that actually does the kind of careful, careful thinking that, that I need is defaulting to habit and instinct. And in a modern society where we rely on incredible amounts of cognitive resources, that's a real problem. Because to fix most modern problems, which involve paperwork, not brawn, I, I need to be able to listen and I have to be able to, to assess options and think things through. And then once I figured something out and figured out what I need or how to go about it, I have to be able to communicate clearly and well. And, and when I can't do that, my problems get worse because all of my energy is going to instinctive brawn when I need a brain that can actually think outside the box of my past experience. So the result is I get stuck in a vicious cycle. Um, and the, the way it works is I'm, I'm scared, I'm overwhelmed, I'm alone. Uh, my defenses amp up, my brain shuts down or goes into overdrive. And because I'm having, I, I, so I do what I know how to do because I don't have the resources to do anything else. So, and if that doesn't work, then I just keep trying it again and again and again, and it still doesn't work. And so my resources diminish, my des desperation escalates. I try to get help. It doesn't work. It doesn't feel like me. It doesn't fit my lifestyle. It doesn't fit my budget. So, and then I just keep going through that. And, and the more that happens, the more scared and overwhelmed and alone I feel, the more desperate and overwhelmed I get. I just keep getting stuck in that cycle. So how do I get out? Well, good news. I have a well-being system and, and it's got all the ingredients I actually need to, to, to make my life better. The main problem isn't that my, I don't have a well-being system. It isn't that I don't have the, the ingredients within my body to, to actually create well-being. The problem is that I, don't, that I can't turn the stress activation off that's preventing, that, that's preventing me from actually accessing that well-being and preventing those systems. So the, the stress activation is keeping those systems from operating optionally. So if I can get out of stress activation, then the restorative operations can kick in, my well-being system can kick in, my body can feel starts to feel better, and then I do too. So how do I turn activation on and off? Well, the the thing that what's turning threat on, what's or what's turning stress on? Well, I get scared or afraid, I feel threatened, then my system pumps me up to be more than I am. So the, the threats thing shows up when I feel like I have to be more than I am and when I need help. But so, but what turns it off? Well. Trying harder doesn't turn it off because that's just what the stress system is about. Trying harder, trying to get it to turn off just creates more stress. What actually turns it off is a context of safety and trust. So, and in a context of safety and trust, then this system, then, then I, no, I no longer need, once, I, once safety and trust show up, however they manage to show up, however I can manage to get them to show up, the, that, that stress activation isn't needed anymore. And it is able to calm, it's, it is, it's able to sort of like go of the reins and then the well-being system is able to show up and start doing the work of well-being. So the question is how does social connection help? Well, here's illustration of the power of social connection. We've got this tree is from New Zealand um, really, it, and it, it lives basically this really, really incredibly tall tree that lives in um, that that lives in a swamp, so un incredibly unstable ground. And how does this tree survive? Well, all of these trees huddle together in really close proximity, and they intertwine their and they intertwine their roots. So they have this huge, massive under underground root system that keeps everybody standing tall. And it's a it's a really good sort of metaphor for a culture of independence. And there's a lot of ways that we can create a culture of independence, but it's it essentially, it's about human beings working together to maximize strengths and minimize weaknesses. And so how does a culture of independence actually help? Well, there's two kinds of stress. One's short-term, one time's long, one time sort of indefinite or long-term. Short-term stress has a workable solution. I just need to find it and implement it. And the faster I can implement it, the, the less bad it is for my health. The um, the long-term indefinite kind of stress is the harder one. 
There's not an easy fix. It's at best, it's a waiting game. I might actually have to accept the unacceptable. And so I'm really stuck with the question of how do I keep going and what, what, what's my quality of life going to be in the interim? So inter interdependence helps with both of these things. First, with short-term stress, I have more access to workable solutions, more help to find it, more ways to implement it. So I, I stay out of stress or I exit faster. Um, with the indefinite kind of stress, at least I get a reality check on what is possible. There's enough, there's enough of us around. So I know other people have been through this before. I'm not the only one. And so, and there's also support. People know what it's like to go through what I'm going through. So there's support while I wait for answers. And then people also have experience that I'm not the only one in my, in, in my tribe who has ever had to accept the unacceptable. So other people have gone through it. They, they, they've figured out ways to do it. They can help me. So there's, there's more support to, to keep going and there's a better better inter interim quality of life. Second thing that I've got going for me, the second way of getting out of, out of stress is oxytocin, which some people call sort of the social support hormone. And it's really, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, this kind of lovely hormone that really comes from caring for each other. And it's, it's sort of ideal for that long-term stress um, because it's, 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 a, it's really about that. It, 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 it was, to, it, we think it came about because the, of these kinds of stresses where you really, you know, if you're, especially for women, if you're, if you're a mother and you, and you're with a small child and you can't move or you're, or you're in a relationship with someone and you can't fix it or you can't move, but, but you need to stay with them. Then, then this, this hormone comes up and actually helps you to be your best self. It creates a, a change. It changes the quality of the experience. The fact that you care enough to stay with somebody else during when they're really stressed out or somebody else cares enough about me to stay with me when I'm really stressed out changes the quality of the experience that both of us are having. And, and as a result of that, it's much easier to it, it, the, 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 the effects of stress are actually changed in our body. This oxytocin makes stress, basically makes stress not so stressful. And it also has a lot of long-term um, benefits for stress as well. And, and so how does oxytocin help? Short-term, qualitatively different experience. Um, basically short-term and long-term, short answer is qualitatively different experience. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm neither case am I, am I as urgent to, to find a solution and I, whatever, whatever I'm dealing with, I'm sort of accompanied by a, uh, by, by a sensation of comfort and not being in this alone and a sensation of being a part of something and also a sensation of offering something of worth to other people. And then the, the last part is this idea of, of, hey, the power of two, I'm much more when I'm with you where relationships where we bring out the best in each other, we help each other get through rough times. Um, you can function when I can't, I can function when you can't. We sort of fill in the gaps for each other. And again, this is the idea that I'm not alone with this. We companion each other through this stuff. We, can, we have ideas and skills that each other doesn't. Um, we help to balance out stuff that's unacceptable. Um, we make faster and lighter work of hard, of, of hard times and, and we create a quality of life that's worth living together. And so there's a lot of benefits of connection. Um, there's a there's a and summary of that. And bravo, social support brought to you by the best of human nature. The end. So. There, I have no words. Um, that was incredible. The chats. The chat is exploding um, with with praise. So, and if you want to know, the people who um, uh, before ABB, the people who, um, and and also the people who actually really nailed this idea of social support and interdependence, um, you heard from them last week. Um, uh, Sherry Mead and, and Chris, you heard from Chris Hansen last week, Sherry Mead, Chris Hansen, intentional peer support. Um, they really have sort of nailed this idea of like, how do you create a relationship that's mutually supportive, that's really good, that's going to bring out the best in us and, um, and, 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 um, and, and change the actual quality of our experience of going through hard times to something that we can both get through together. They're, they're just, a, it's just a brilliant um, it's just a brilliant um, 
a framework for, for approaching relationships that tons of neurodivergent people have used and has helped us to understand relationships in ways we never would have otherwise. Sarah, I don't know if you can see the chat. Um, Sherry and Chris are, are here cheering you on. Oh, thanks. You, thank you so much. Sarah, are you okay with inviting questions? They're fantastic. If people have questions, this would, that would be awesome. I was hoping to leave some time for that and not yak away all of your time. So thank you. That would be awesomeness. Awesome. Sierra. Yeah, not really a question, more just uh, um, admiration of, Sarah, I think the way that you um, bring the connection of kind of like whole body holistic view of we're not just talking about mental health. We're not just talking about physical health. We're talking about what what a body does under stress and what a body does under isolation um, is just really amazing. And I, I think that's that's such a missing part of the conversation so often in kind of both separate circles of mental health and physical health. And um, I just, I really appreciate your kind of, your way you bring those together as this is, this is one thing and this is how all these are connected and this is how we can do something like social connection that addresses so many different parts of health and well-being and everything. Um, yeah, just amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I mean, that's what ABB is doing. I mean, you are, you, that's, that's what ABB, this community is doing is actually living, li living this way, this kind of social, uh, this kind of, this model of social connection. It's, it's, um, it's it's phenomenal the impact that you're having. It really is an incredible thing to watch. Um, not only the idea that so many people who have in separation um, endured these negative, like not negative, I mean, negative is like an understatement, like these traumatic, deeply harmful um, social experiences, all the while thinking that each, each of us were alone and the only person experiencing that. And then you bring people together and, um, you know, as you were describing so many of these things. So first off, your, your, one of your many gifts uh, that you shared with us tonight was the idea of taking these like really complex concepts and turning them into graphics, like, you know, as part of the universal design thing that I think like really, really landed. Anyway, the chat was like, oh, that, 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 yeah, wow, that's my life, right? So there's just so much, so much of that, 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 that you brought for people, a framework of understanding and, and shifting the narrative of, of past experiences. Monique. Hi, Monique here. Uh, Sarah, thank you. Uh, I, two years ago, I had a heart attack and it wasn't related to heart disease. And um, one day the cardiologist that I got to see for a year said, oh, maybe it's because you're so very socially isolated. And I thought, you think? You think that's what's going on? <laughs> Look, I just I get very frustrated with um, medical community and I'm a retired counselor. So a therapist, I'm going to lump the therapists in there too, who just fail to recognize the interconnectivity of health and well-being. And I really appreciate how you came at it from such an integrated approach and a somatic approach. Like you really, uh, it wasn't just one part of the body experience. It was a fully embodied presentation. And I really appreciated that. And um, I guess my million dollar question is, and it's an it's a lifelong quest is, how do I make friends? Oh my goodness, I realize I'm socially isolated, but like you you started the whole conversation at the beginning with that that double uh, conflict, that double problem. Like I know I need to be socially isolated, but people really bug me. 
and it's really hard to be with people, but I want to be with people. Like it's this whole back and forth dance and I have not figured it out. Uh, once a week, I look forward to this because this is one way that I can be with people and in a way that is comforting and energizing for me to be with people. It's not exhausting coming to All Brains Belong. So um, yeah, so I guess again, no questions, just a whole lot of kudos and thank yous. Although if you do have the answer to how to make friends, I mean, that would be brilliant. If you could sum it up in like the last seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> the, the only the, the only thing that I do think is that it's really important to pay attention to um, what's like that balance, like like the stress system. My stress system wants me to jump in with both feet. It wants an immediate answer, and so it's very important for me to pay attention to the experience I'm having with other people. And to sort of like these qualitatively small shifts. So to, to just like, if I'm trying to move from like isolation to, 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 to social connection, it's, it, it's like, I'm, I'm not going for like full body immersion. I'm going for like, you know, dipping a toe in and seeing what that feels like, and then getting some experience and building on that, that it's these slow, it's, it's using this well being system and these well being concepts to to not stress myself out more and to um and to and and to just explore the territory of what of, of, to explore this new territory and get a sense of what's going to what's going to help me what's going to make me feel better or worse what's going to help me to feel connected and what and what doesn't and and just sort of going in some directions and then feeling having per, total permission to back off and you know just and to just take my time and and try some things out Amen to that. Taylor and then Chris. Um, so I, I found it really fascinating uh, when you were talking about that connection between mind and body and, and how social connection can cause issues um, like physical health problems and it can also exacerbate mental health issues. And I was just wondering, I don't even know if this is a question you could answer, but how do you decide which one to address first? Like, I know personally, um, with my neurodivergent issues, I have certain sensory problems that make me a very difficult person to be around. So that impedes social interaction. So I, I wonder like drawing how to like, I don't even know if I'm capable of being coherent, sorry. Um, you know, finding a way to make those interactions like, would you say that social interaction will eventually make those issues um, less, or is this something that you know you need to figure out how to deal with those issues first? I don't even know if I'm being coherent. You're you're doing a great job. Like the 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 idea is, stress can affect all of this stuff. I don't know what's what is innate for me and what's stress. I, until my stress goes down, I don't know what's possible. And so, just and, and so I guess it's like. Oh, to start with, you know, whatever. I mean, you don't have to connect with human beings. If, it, if it's better to connect with an animal, if it's better to connect with the stuffy, if it's better to connect with the sensory experience that you enjoy. I mean, it, it, what matters is that there's that that it's a it's looking for for meaningful connections and 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 then and and then gradually finding ways to expand those. So sort of beginning to explore the territory of those things. And, and it can even be, I mean, one of the most richest connections I, I end up having when I'm not in a stressed place is with myself, is with my own, my own body, my own sensory experiences, my own experience of the immediate environment around me. So it, it's that well-being system has just a lot to offer. And the more I get into it, the more, um, the, the more, possibilities sort of seem to sort of slowly emerge from that. And then it's a matter of tiptoeing around to see what else I want to explore. I never thought of it that way. Thank you. That's fascinating. I'll have to think about that. Chris. Yes. Hi. Um, oh, I'm looking up and it's weird. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm projecting you onto a screen and I'm not quite sure how to make it a little bit less weird. Maybe I'll just, yeah, no. 
Um, not going to try and be too clever. So apologies for that. I can see you all. Um, uh, yeah, firstly, uh, thank you, Sarah. You, you, you sort of beautifully articulate something that, um, uh, that that makes so much sense when you say it. Um, it's like, oh yeah, of course, that's really obvious, and yet nobody's saying it like that. You know, we're all ta we're we're talked to, talk to about dopamine and norepinephrine and reuptake. You know, and 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 all these, uh, and 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 it's brought down to chemicals uh, so much when uh, words like connection and friend uh, would be so you know so helpful and make a lot of sense to many of us or trauma or you know whatever um and i just wanted to to say to that that uh, uh question about how do you make a friend that <laughs> we um in in ips uh do uh like what we call co-reflection which is sort of like a, a team meeting and we reflect on um you know how we're how we are uh working and and uh, and our interactions and the most meaningful and rich one recently was someone says, well, how do we make friends? And we had this wonderful, enriching, very alive conversation. And um, and I think we all came away just uh, feeling really um, uh, brightened by it. Uh, and I was um, uh, just going to put out there that I, I think this would be a great topic for just a little group to get together and just talk about how do you make friends? How do you connect? Mm. You know, what do you do if you're held captive, held hostage at a cocktail party? Because you have to be there. And, you know, you're feeling like, a, like a fish out of water. And, you know, uh, what do other people do? Um, and maybe all brains belong sometime might, you know, uh, 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 host something like that because absolutely everyone even the ones that we all thought were were really social uh uh just needed this so much so thanks very much mm. oh thanks, i Chris. can't that's fantastic I can't, yeah i mean i can't imagine a better way to wrap this up right i mean so you know what i think sarah what you have invited us to do today and i think as chris you just wrapped this up so perfectly right it's about um, like zooming out and really shifting, like, and, and really it's the unlearning thing, unlearning what is, you know, what, what do we think we know about relationships? Um, and can we return to this, you know, more authentic, more, more simplified um, state of, of viewing the world? Um, and so with that, I really appreciate Sarah. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, and, you know, speaking of, of, you know, unlearning and reimagining, next week we will be applying the same concept to looking at our relationship to work. Um, we will be hearing from um, a panel of um, ABB community members um, sharing their experiences about how they have been um, shifting their relationship to work. Um, it's we're gonna it's gonna be a slightly different format of a community panel. It's gonna be a shorter panel so that we have uh, plenty of time for discussion. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everybody.